Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to this special series on the 1983 Beirut Marine Barracks bombing to complement my first work of nonfiction, titled Targeted Beirut, the 1983 Marine Barracks bombing and the untold origin story of the War on Terror, written with military historian and Pulitzer Prize finalist, James Scott. It hits shelves on September 24th and is available for pre-order now in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook, narrated by Ray Porter. James Scott joins me to co-host this podcast series. Our guest today is Rabbi Arnie Resnikoff. Rabbi Resnikoff joined the Naval Reserves during high school, and after NROTC in college, he served as an officer in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam. Following Vietnam, he attended rabbinical school and then returned to the Navy. On October 21st, 1983, two days before the bombing, he was in Beirut, Lebanon, conducting a memorial service for a slain Marine, Alan Soifred. He was offered transportation out of Beirut on October 22nd, but declined travel on the Jewish Sabbath, which put him in Beirut for the attack, where he was one of the first people on site of one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history that resulted in the greatest single-day loss of life for the United States Marine Corps since the Battle of Iwo Jima in World War II. The attack claimed the lives of 220 Marines, 18 sailors, and three soldiers. This is his story. Rabbi Resnikoff, who had spent the day ministering to the dead and dying, found a few moments to pen a letter to his wife and mother. I am all right, but things here are beyond description, he wrote. There are bodies and pieces of bodies all over. In closing, he assured his family he would see them soon. This is one time I'm needed, he concluded. I'm all right. It's just a terrible, terrible tragedy. Thank you so much, sir. It is such an honor to uh, to be here with you and being able to, to do this. And thank you so much for sharing your story. It's just... Uh, it's, I mean, it's my honor, and I'm so happy that the story is being told. Oh, I, I, and I, I'll share a little tidbit. I should probably ask Ray Porter if... Uh, if uh, if I can keep this in, but he's the the narrator of this audiobook, and he's done over fifty audiobooks before. He's a, he's a wonderful wonderful man, and uh, he's never been brought to tears by a story before. And he texted me this morning and said, "This is the first time in all his years of oh, narrating goodness. books that uh, that he'd been brought to tears and had to stop wow. doing the reading for a second. So, um, wow. and that's because of uh, because of your story. So, thank you. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so let's kick it. I, I let's kick it off. Does that sound <laughs> good? Um, I, I, before we get to the to that to the that day and the things that led up to it, uh, I was curious about your path into into the Navy and what that was like. The year that you came in and uh, what that path was like that uh, that got you to to Lebanon. Well, yeah. actually, my story starts with my father. He was three years old when my grandparents escaped from Russia, and because of that he was such a super, super patriotic man. So uh, he uh, he actually quit his job. He was a lawyer and quit his job the day after Pearl Harbor and went to the recruiter and said, take me. And they said, well, it'll be three months before there's a JAG course, you know, a military lawyer. He said, you don't understand. I quit my job. Take me now. And they said, well, we can take you as an enlisted man. He said, take me. So he went into the CBs in the South Sea for the duration of the war. War. And when I was growing up, as I was the oldest of his three sons, he just communicated to me that he thought his going was paying his dues, partly because this country had given us such freedom, and he expected me to at least go in for one assignment. So I actually was in the enlisted reserves in high school. Then I switched to NROTC in college, and from college went straight to the rivers of Vietnam uh, for a year. And uh, uh, you know, I was an ensign, and uh, there was a circuit-riding Christian chaplain, Wes, uh, Les Westling, happened to be an Episcopal priest, and you know, no, no one in the rivers had a, enough people to merit their own chaplain. So he was a circuit rider for the whole Mekong Delta. We never knew when he'd show up or how he'd show up. So when he first showed up, he would look through the personnel records to see who was new, and I was one of the new ones. So he said, Ensign Reznikov. I said, yes, sir. He said, you're Jewish. He was looking at my personnel card. I said, yes, sir. So he said, you just volunteered to be the Jewish lay leader for 
the ship. Later, I volunteered, I found out, to be the Jewish lay leader for the Mekong Delta. You know, in other words, that's the person who's the point of contact for information, holidays coming up. So I always tell people I, I learned how to be a good chaplain from his example, but I also learned the military definition of the word volunteer from him. Oh, yeah. I kept finding that I had volunteered. So anyway, <clears throat> because he uh, developed a relationship with me, we loved each other. Um, he actually was the first person to plant the seed in my mind in terms of being a rabbi. So um, I still had more obligated service because of ROTC. So after Vietnam, I went to Europe with naval intelligence, wrote submarines. But I was corresponding with the rabbinical school. And as soon as I uh, got out, I went to a Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City, became a rabbi, and then came back to the Navy for what I thought would be one assignment, but turned out to be 25 years as a Navy chaplain. So that's the background that got me in the Navy. Oh my gosh. What um, what's, your, what's your memory, uh, a distinct memory or lesson or something that surprised you from your time in in vietnam what's what was your your takeaway from that experience i my biggest takeaway experience is how one person can change the whole culture of the community of the command we had a very bad experience when i arrived we had a commanding officer who still had a month and a half to go who was drunk all the time, he, he, you know, it, 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 everybody, I think we were more in fear of what was going to happen because of him than the Viet Cong. We were in the rivers as part of Operation Game Warden, which was to keep the rivers free of Viet Cong. But he once beached the ship and we didn't even report it. We got off high tide. I mean, so we were, we were deathly afraid. Then his replacement, Jim Fisher, we used to call him Gentleman Jim Fisher, ethical uh changed everything we were proud to serve now this was you know a, a converted lst from world war ii converted for the rivers the hull was reinforced for helicopters where the tanks would have gone during world war ii they put in workshops to repair the small boats so the captain uh, uh was just a lieutenant commander himself but in both cases, mustangs you know people who had risen from the enlisted ranks to officer but the difference between those two men, which drove such a difference in the culture and how we acted, that's the lesson I took from Vietnam. One person, one leader makes the difference. No kidding. And before I let James jump in here, um, uh, what was it like? To, how long did you spend on submarines? Then I mean, you've had quite you had a, you had a, a quite a varied experience in the, in the navy. You I had a very there. varied experience. You know, if you add my line time, which was almost almost four years and my chaplain time, almost 25 years, long time. So it was it was just a coincidence that when I was in high school in the reserves, it was a submarine unit, never knowing that later I would get into submarines. But I, I rode uh, submarines out of Rota, Spain. Uh, back then, we couldn't even tell anyone we were riding submarines. Now, because of all the books, you know, about the submarines during the Cold, Cold War, the rule, as I understand it, is I just keep and say the name of the submarine and what time, but I can say I rode submarines and we did some pretty uh, iffy things you know, in the submarines. Yeah. Uh, and, and but later on in my career, I would become the uh, senior chaplain for the submarine base in Groton, Connecticut, the New London submarine base. So I would ride very short spurt submarines again because uh, submarines normally don't keep chaplains, but because I was the a senior chaplain, I got to ride them again. So I had three different times in my life with submarines, and they're all memorable. Wow. I think some of the, even today, some of the, the biggest or maybe some of the only se secrets left in the military are, are around submarines, um, and, uh, even to, to this day, the, the silent service. I think uh, you're right. I think you're I mean, right. and they still, they still play such a high Bible school. Ball. We, in high school, we go out on the diesel. You know, the, I, I was living in DC. They'd fly us to North. Norfolk, Virginia, and on a weekend, we'd go out uh, and the submarine would dive maybe 15, 16 times. We'd stand in a different place and we'd come out stinking, you know, those old diesel submarines. Then, of course, by the time I got to Groton, it was the sleek uh, nuclear submarines. 
Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. And but I, I know I said I was going to James jump in here, but uh, path up to Lebanon. You'd been there before uh, 1983. Is that right? Or before October of 1983, you'd been there? That's correct. I, I was part of an experiment. They took a, a Jewish, a Catholic, and a Protestant chaplain. Back then in the 80s, those were the only kind of chaplains we had. Now we have Muslim, uh, Buddhist, Hindu. But so they took a, a, a rabbi, a priest, and a minister, put us on the staff of the Commander Sixth Fleet. It was Vice Admiral uh, Ed Martin. And his flagship, the Puget Sound, was stationed in Gaeta, Italy. And our job was to circuit ride for all the ships in the Sixth Fleet. Uh, a lot of civilians, when you say Sixth Fleet, they think of a set number of ships. But as I'm sure you know, it's any ship that happens to be in the Mediterranean is part of the Sixth Fleet. And then they, when they leave, they become a part of a different fleet. So at that point, it was a much larger Navy. There were about 40 ships at any given time. When the uh, multinational force went into Lebanon and it included so many Marines, the, the Mao, uh, so we added the Marines to our circuit riding. So I would go uh, every couple weeks to Beirut uh, for just a couple days, two or three days. Uh, when I was there the weekend of the explosion, it was for a specific reason. Uh, you mentioned in the book, uh, Alan Soifer, a, a Jewish Marine from New Hampshire, Nashua, New Hampshire, was the fifth or sixth individual killed out of the 1,300 Americans in the American component of the multinational force. He was shot in the chest while he was in a jeep examining the perimeter. So they moved heaven and hell uh, uh, to get his body back to New Hampshire because in Judaism, we believe in burying as quickly as possible. So he, he was actually buried something like the 18th by the time I could get to Beirut, so so the other Marines, even though hardly any others were Jewish, out of respect for his religion, wanted a Jewish chaplain to do a memorial service. It's one of those only in America stories that I love so much. So uh, getting to Beirut from Italy wasn't so easy because the Beirut airport was closed and the war was going. So so I remember going from Gaeta to Naples, Naples to Sigonella, which was the center of Navy air at that point, Sigonella to Cyprus, and then zigzagging on the helicopter from Cyprus to Beirut. So by the time I got there, it was the 21st. Uh, and as I say, the burial in New Hampshire had already been the 18th, I think. But I led a memorial service, and then the colonel in charge of the Marines Colonel Garrity said, okay, tomorrow, Saturday, we'll get you. I don't travel on Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath, so I'll wait till Sunday. That's the reason I was there when the attack happened. Sure. And the, the chaplains, by the way, don't forget that. They they thought it was part of God's plan that I was there when every chaplain counted, when one more person counted. So I was there just because I observed the Sabbath. Wow. Yeah, and I'm, Jack, I might jump in here for a quick second, and just for our listeners, you know, um, Ar Arnie, it might be nice just to kind of talk about what the duties of a chaplain in the, in the Navy are, because the Marines actually don't have their own uh, chaplain service. They they depend on the Navy to provide their uh, their faith leaders, just like they do for for medical care. So, tell us a little bit about like the role of a chaplain for the Navy and the Marine Corps. It's very important, you know, and, the, and I think Navy chaplains are the only officers that actually wear three different uniforms because uh, we serve the Navy, the Marines, and the Coast Guard. If you, if I'm just visiting the Marines, so I, I started out in my Navy uniform, but after everything got dirty, but the ones who were there permanently with the Marines wore the Marine uniform, and chaplains with the Coast Guard do the same with the Coast Guard uniform. We teach in the chaplain school that a chaplain has four responsibilities. The first is advising the command on any issue that involves religion, ethics, or morals. Uh, then, then three, in terms of the people, is we uh, uh, we we um, serve. A, you know, in, in terms of the faith uh, for, for people of our own faith. So we'll always be rabbis. I'll be a rabbi to the Jew, a priest to be a Catholic. But then we facilitate for other religions, which means that I'll never hold a Christian service, but I'll make sure a Christian service is held. I'll make sure they have the Bibles, the prayer books. I'll make sure no one has a hard time getting there. And then, and this is the 
something that many civilians don't understand. We uh, care for all. That's the phrase, which means that someone religious or non-religious can come to us. And in the whole military, the only person who has 100% confidentiality, privileged communication, is the chaplain more than a psychiatrist, more than a lawyer. So many people who came to me and come to other chaplains just need a caring heart, a, a uh, sounding board, um, you know, and, and because it's secret, I've had people come to me and say, tomorrow I'm running away, I'm going UA, or what the Army calls AWOL. Uh, they, they came to me when they weren't allowed to tell anyone they were gay. They could tell me as a chaplain. They could tell me if they used drugs. You know, and, and they knew that it was confidential. So the chaplain is an extremely important person in the military. Absolutely. And so, and, and, and two, and as Jack had noted earlier, you'd been in Beirut before. And so just to kind of give readers and listeners a little bit of a, a background on this, of course, this is a 1983 at this point. The, the Marines have been sent in as a sort of peacekeeping force here uh, in Lebanon. They've been there since the uh, fall of, of 82, but we're now into 1983 at this point. And of course, the situation on the ground there with all the uh, the secular tug, uh, tug of war going on politically between different Lebanese forces starts to draw more and more attention toward the Marines. And of course, with that comes an uptick in violence against these guys. And you're seeing it through uh, mortar rounds, artillery rounds, and of course, sniper attacks. You were actually in Beirut at one point during, b- before the bombing, before your trip over in the bombing, but during some of this, uh, these these artillery attacks and had to sort of take cover in some of the bunkers. Tell us a little bit about what Beirut was like in the summer of 83 in the lead up to the bombing. Well, it's, it's an interesting question. And I actually haven't thought about it in a while, but my first visits to Beirut uh we would go out in jeeps with a uh, gunner follow-up to have dinner in town, you know, with uh, religious leaders, with uh, civil leaders. We would try Lebanese restaurants. I remember driving along the coast and looking down at the big Ferris wheel uh, on the beach and thinking what a beautiful city it was. You know, it was called the Paris of the Levant, you know, the Paris of the Mideast. It's interesting that the, the, country, the cities that are most war-torn were the most beautiful. You know, the Saigon was the Pearl of the Orient. You know, I remember going to Dubrovnik uh, with the Sixth Fleet and seeing all these bullet holes and buildings, but such a beautiful, beautiful building. So Beirut was beautiful. And at the beginning, we would go out. Now, again, we had a Jeep as a runner, you know, uh, Marines with uh, rifles, just in case. But there was a freedom. Uh, then, you know, as things started to get worse, we, we would go out much less. I remember once we did have a trip to the embassy, uh, you know, it, it, it was still fascinating. But after the uh, October 23rd uh, attack, we didn't go out. And it, we almost didn't show our heads. You know, people kept in the bunkers. And, uh, you know, so so you're right. I, I could feel just as a visitor every time I went how the situation had got tenser uh, and more frightening and, of course, sadder because of the casualties. You know, and part of your role there too is you're you're coming over and is you're having to comfort these guys. And 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 so many of these Marines are very young at this point. They're 18, 19, 20 years old. Uh they're, you know, for some of them, it's their first time away from home, first time definitely overseas. And and suddenly they find themselves in this this very hostile environment. And uh and so I mean the the role that you play and the role that uh Father Pucciarelli and uh Chaplain Wheeler played becomes such an important one, I think, for these these young men in harm's way. Yes, and especially because they're in a, an environment where they they think they have to be macho all the time. And when they came in to see me, you know, they could cry, they could open up, they could tell me how they missed their family members. I remember one person showed me a picture of his dog and told me how much he missed the dog in a way that I'm sure he would not be sharing, you know, with the others. The other thing is you mentioned uh, Father Pucciarelli and Danny Wheeler. Sometimes chaplains need chaplains, you know, so I think they were very happy when I would visit also, just like when I would visit ships in the in the Mediterranean, the chaplains were so happy to be able to talk uh, to someone. So, 
I think being a chaplain to other chaplains was an important part also. I should say that, you know, Danny Wheeler was in one building. Uh, Pooch, you know, Father Pucciarelli was in the other. I think they were about 75 yards apart. And whenever I would visit, I would alternate uh, buildings. So I would stay with Pooch. I would stay with Danny. Um, you know, the time of the explosion, I actually was supposed to stay with Danny. But Pooch had something on his mind mind that he wanted to talk to me about. So he asked me to stay with him. Who knows, that might have saved my life. Uh, so I was in the building close, not the building that was hit. Yeah, and just so, uh, yeah, for, for our listeners here, you know, the building that was ultimately targeted by Hezbollah, well, of course, was the BLT, the Battalion Landing Team Headquarters. And it was a four-story building made out of, you know, concrete and rebar, uh, had a sign out front calling it the Beirut Helton, uh, military discounts welcome. Uh, and of course, it was sort of the, uh, the this this towering building there. And that is that is where uh, Chaplain Wheeler lived up on the fourth floor there. And of course, his his uh, compadre, Father George Pucciarelli, lived in an adjacent building. And of course, that's when you're saying you would alternate between the two. You would go from the BLT, which was the building that was targeted, or to the adjacent building with Father Pucciarelli. And so, um, so you know, tell us a little bit about that visit. You know, when you arrive in Beirut for what's going to be the this 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 fateful trip, tell us about that trip before the lead up to the actual bombing what was it like on the ground what was uh what was the environment like how were the troops i mean all of that kind of stuff yeah it was uh, uh it was actually a very interesting story my my uh wife and daughter and i had actually gone to rome to the airport to pick up my mother who was going to visit and i had planned to take leave because i had been to beirut many times i'd been very busy uh, and, and, you know, it was before the time of cell phones, so we drove back from the airport back to our place in Gaeta, and the phone was ringing off the hook. And, and it turned out to be my senior chaplain, who was a Catholic priest, uh, Bob Riley, and he's, he told me, you have to go back to Beirut. And I, I thought he was kidding, because I said, you know, I'm, I'm on leave, I'm with my mother. He said, yeah, but a Jewish Marine has died, and they want you. So you can't say no to something like that. So, um, you know, as I say, so I, it, it was a, a hard to get there, but I got there on the Friday. People were really um, still in pretty good uh, spirits. Um, we actually had some kind of a uh, uh, USO show, and Iwo Jima, one of the ships off the coast, sent pizzas, and, and uh, they were labeled Iwo Hut. I remember that, and uh, and 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 also these young Marines. Uh, I want to say kids, especially now when I look back as a seventy-seven-year-old. But we're not supposed to say that. Uh, they they didn't have much longer to go, so they were in a pretty good mood between the pizzas and the USO, and looking forward to the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and that's why it was such a surprise. Uh, you know, when the attack happened on uh, uh, Sunday at 6.22 in the morning. And it was, um, most most of the Marines were still asleep, especially since it had been a nice night the night before. And, you know, and there were two, as you said, two buildings. And I remember at 6.22, I happened to be in the head and latrine, I think they call it, uh, brushing my teeth. And so I was in a T-shirt and trousers, and all of a sudden, the, the entire building shook. You know, we learned later it was the building next door that had been hit, but we thought we had been hit by a sh uh, mortar or a shell. Our windows exploded. The doors came off the hinges. I remember throwing myself on the ground, still in the head, and then crawling out. Everybody else was on the ground. Slowly, we, we were getting up and almost slapping each other on the back, thanking God we made it. And then all these screams started coming, and we understood that, you know, the other building uh, had been hit. Uh, as you said, it was a four-story building. When the FBI did their investigation, you know, they called it one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history. And I actually think that the building rose, maybe only, you know, an inch or a fraction, but it actually rose and then collapsed. And, you know, uh, 
you know, the, the two walls slid down and that's what saved Danny's life because he was right against the wall and he rolled down, you know, the inside and got, and got uh, buried. But I remember uh, uh, Dan, uh, Pooch was in his camouflage, of course. He grabbed uh, the stole, put it around his neck because he knew he was going to be giving last rites. And he just said, follow me. And I, I'll always remember those words. And that's all I did. I followed him. We went out. And, you know, there's an old expression, I couldn't believe my eyes. For the first time in my life, I understood that expression because the building wasn't there. I, I thought I went the wrong way. I thought I, I got confused. And there was dust in the air, smoke in the air. Uh, so finally, we started to focus, and you could see the building was just rubble. There were bodies, pieces of bodies all around. I remember uh, at one point, it sounds almost uh, uh, bad to say I thought it, but it was, it was so much like a horror movie. I said to myself, all I need is to see someone without a head, and then they, they carried a body without a head. Uh, it, it was just not real. But, but I remember... Uh, one of the, I, I hardly ever try to correct people when they uh, write or give speeches. The one thing I always correct is if someone says 241 Marines were killed, I correct them. I say 241 American military personnel. And then, of course, followed by uh, the French who were hit minutes later. But 241, because there were, as you know, 220 Marines, 18 Navy, and three Army. And it's very important not just to honor the people who died, but to point out that the eight out of the eighteen Navy, I think fifteen or six of sixteen were medical personnel. Our whole medical uh, battalion was wiped out. It was one doctor and the rest of corpsmen. And as you said, the Navy gives the medical just like they give the chaplains. So that left us worse because with all the wounded and dying, we had. No one trained to help them. And that's when the dentists stopped in. And my understanding is now dentists actually get additional training because of what happened in Beirut. And everyone involved in medicine now uh, gets triage training. But I remember when we went out, uh, you know, we would, I, I would hold someone. I would say, help is coming. Uh, I, I would try to wipe uh, uh, dirt or blood from their face. I, I, I would rip my T-shirt, my undershirt, you know, and do that. And then the undershirt was gone. I, I took my kippa, my, my skull cap, and I wiped blood and dirt and got lost in the rubble. And when we had a time to take our breath, Pooch um, came up to me and he said, I want all of these people in this country where every religion is gunning for every religion, not just to remember that chaplains helped everyone, but that Christian and Jewish side by side, and he pulled on his, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, the red uh, uh, cloth that he had around his neck, stole, and he said, I've never seen you without your head covered. So he ripped a piece of his camouflage uniform off and put it on my head. And uh, that's, that's it, was, it began to be called the camouflage kippah. And I would say Beirut affected the military in many ways. One way that a lot of people don't know is just by coincidence. You know, every time I use the word coincidence, I think of the expression, coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. You know, so it's a little more than coincidence. It's providential. Uh, in Congress, they had been debating a bill. It was actually an amendment to the appropriations bill called the Military Apparel uh, Amendment, which would give Jews in the military the right to wear their head coverings uh, uh, with their uniform. Chaplains could do that, but not anyone who happened to be Jewish, you know, otherwise. And uh, it had been, uh, it had failed to pass for two years in a row. And uh, some people were saying it would hurt morale if we looked different. And uh, although I never really understood that because it was no different than one person's glasses or one person's bald head or one person's mustache. But for some reason, this became an issue. So, uh, that story about, uh, and it pooches the hero of that story. And you know, he created the key, gave it to me. 
was read into the congressional record, both in the Senate and the House, and it passed. And that was the beginning of many, many um, advances in what we call religious accommodation in the military, but it started with that. And, you know, I, I believe in diversity. I believe when you look at American military, and now you can see someone with a turban, you can see someone with a kippah, you can see, you know, I mean, it reminds us that we're not like so many parts of the world where people who are different fight. We can stand side by side. So I'm pr very proud of the story of that kippah. There's a great, amazing photo of it as well. Um, just uh, incredibly moving photo. And where is that? Uh, where is that today? Where's that kippah today? Well, I donated it to the, cha the chaplain school, which was in Norfolk, and the, I mean in Newport, Rhode Island, and I moved, and then I moved back. So I hope they haven't lost it in all the moves. But they have a small cha chaplain museum at the uh, Naval Chaplain School, and I donated it to them. Also, I donated, or I, I co coordinated, in front of the chapel in Beirut, we had a beautiful plywood plaque. It had the old chaplain corps in, uh, insignia logo that was an anchor, and on one side it had a cross, on the other side tablets of the Ten Commandments. The insignia has changed now, but uh, at the top it said peacekeeping, and at the bottom it said chapel. And after the explosion, you can still see the top peacekeeping, but the bottom is just charred wood, you know, uh, uh, burnt and charred. And so to me, it's such a, a symbol of the ideal peace at the top and the uh, reality war at the bottom. So they do have that at the chaplain school in Newport. I know that because I uh, purposely went to visit. Yeah, uh, Arnie, thank you. And, you know, just to kind of let our listeners know, so, you know, the the BLT headquarters there, it had 350 soldiers, sailors, and Marines in it. At the time, a truck bomb was detonated in the lobby of it. And uh, uh, so of those, 241 were killed and about 112 were were wounded. So it gives just to give listeners just a sense of the scope of this tragedy at this point. As you noted, it was the FBI said it was the largest non-nuclear explosion they'd ever investigated. And so you arrived literally within minutes of this going off. And so I wanted to kind of slow down a little bit and talk about what it what did it look like there for listeners who've never you know have only read about this kind of stuff in history books or newspaper accounts. I mean, really Give us a camera view of, of of the immediacy after that blast. And then, of course, tell us in more detail your role throughout that morning. Well, as I say, it was so early in the morning. Most of us were half-dressed. Uh, most of us uh, slept with our shoes on, uh, slept in you know uniforms ready to spring out uh, in case something happened, although we didn't expect it. And when we went out that door, the dust from the building that had exploded just filled the air, smoke, screams, um, people yelling for help, and, and people saying, help them, help them. Even people who were wounded themselves wanted us to help the people who were more severely wounded. So the, the Marines, and not every Marine in, in the building that was spared could actually help because when this happened, and then we heard that the French had been attacked, we didn't know if this was an all-out, full-scale war. So a lot of the Marines had to man their guns. A lot of the Marines had to go to their stations in the bunker. You know, the Marines had different stations. Uh, we used to joke among us, the chaplains, that we had the uh, foxhole of opportunity. You know, wherever we were, we would uh, jump in. Uh, but but Marines knew where to go in case uh, there was a danger. By the way, when I say that foxhole opportunity, it's interesting. Whenever we were under danger, and as you said, there were other attacks, mortar rounds, shells. Uh, one thing that uh, always happened when I jumped into a foxhole or a bunker, what the Marines called them, uh, someone would say to the others in a loud voice, what's your language? The chaplain's here. That was, you know, that I, I always saw that as a welcome to me. You know, it was marine language for welcoming me. But then after we were there long enough, they would ask me questions and serious questions, because sometimes we 
just for a few minutes, sometimes for a very long time. And one question that invariably would come up was chaplain, here we are in the Mideast where so many great religions were born. How can there be so much blood shed in the name of religion? And I always remember that I finally came up with a partial answer, not a not a complete answer, but I said to them, you know, in the past, uh, we wouldn't be asking questions. War was the way of the world. If you had power, you either tried to get more or lose it. You know, you tried to get more slaves or you would be a slave. Uh, now, the only reason we question the presence of war is because of the visions of our faiths, I think, that talk about a day when nation shall not lift up sword against nation. War will be no more. We'll beat our swords into plowshares. And I think that's the, the positive image, hope, dream that religion uh, has given us. And, you know, for now, that that's all I could say. But uh, I tell you, we, we try to help the wounded. We tr you know, eventually, ambulances started coming, uh, helicopters started coming from some of the ships along shore. We had many other people that tried to help. But in that beginning, you know, we, we were looking over our shoulder. We didn't know if another attack was going to come. And we just tried to be human beings. And, and I'll tell you another thing that when you talk about the role of a chaplain, when I went to chaplain school, and you know, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force each have a different chaplain school, but we teach roughly the same things. We all have an exercise, you know, where we where we imagine being on a battlefield and we cradle someone who's wounded. And, you know, in chaplain school, they would try to uh, throw in a twist so that if someone Catholic was wounded, they'd have me go. And the Catholic would say, I need Catholic last rites. So what should I do as a rabbi? And we discussed it in the class, and the priests would tell me what they would want me to do. The ministers would tell me what they would want me to do. But in that disaster, in that attack, nobody asked me a religious question. Nobody asked me for last words. They said, if I die, please tell my mother I love her. If I die, get word to my family that, you know, I'm thinking of them. These were human questions, and, and I was the last person to hear their words. Jeez. So, you know, um, when we were researching the book, uh, we were looking, we looked at Father George Pucciarelli's oral history that he did soon after with the Marine Corps. And, you know, and since you guys were there together working sort of tag team, I'm sure the situation was very similar for you as well. But he told the Marine Corps historian back in 1983 that on that Sunday, he tended to more than 150 dead and wounded Marine soldiers and sailors just to kind of give us sense of the scope of this tragedy for listeners there. And I, you were right there with him. I mean, the two of you were sort of dividing and conquering as you kind of worked your way around that that pile. So, I mean, it gives listeners an idea of just the magnitude of what you were facing that day. And and and, and how, how how do you go about comforting people in that kind of situation? I mean, how's, you know, what, tell us about how, how, how you handle that. You know, and the digging went on for about four days is afterwards when we were digging for pieces, uh, uh, bodies and pieces of bodies, and the people digging needed help, needed comfort. Uh, on one side, you know, there was this sense of survivor's guilt, you know, that so many people felt they had let down their comrades because they had lived. And so part of what I saw my mission was, was to tell them, if you lived, you were chosen to live to carry on the memory of the people that were lost. Be proud and 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 be positive, you know, that you're alive to tell the story. It's their story, but you, you have to tell it. Uh, but there's also something in Jewish tradition, you know, as I mentioned, the burial is supposed to be as quick as possible, 24 hours if possible. But then we have stages of mourning. Um, and, you know, grief is, is individual, is, is human. Mourning is the, as I see, it is the ritual with which to deal with the grief and, and to make progress through it. So in Judaism, the first step of mourning, seven days after the burial, is called Shiva. People sit around, visitors come to the family that's lost someone, and you tell, you're supposed to only talk about the person who died, the stories about when they were alive. 
And so that you are admitting the body is gone, but the memory will be there and we're cementing the memory. But the interesting thing about that in a traditional Shiva setting, if you go as a visitor, you don't start the conversation. If a mourner just wants you to sit and be present, you, you sit. And then when they start the conversation, you engage. So when I saw these uh, Marines and sailors and soldiers digging and digging, I tried to use that idea. I would go next to them and I would not initiate the conversation. I would just be there. And sometimes I could see it just helped them to know I was next to them. But if they started talking, then I would talk. And I would try to steer the conversation to their description of someone that had been lost or someone they didn't know had been lost or not, someone they hoped was still alive. And we talk, you know, about the living and we try to get away from just focusing, focusing, focusing on the dead. And, you know, uh, if, if I could tell this another interesting story, um, it, just in terms of the humanity, you know, um, my so, so I mentioned to you that my mother was visiting in Italy. So it's my mother, my wife, my daughter, who was about five at that point. Yeah. Um, they didn't know for eight hours whether I would be alive or not whether I was alive or not. The senior chaplain, Father Riley, from the flagship, called them probably within minutes after the explosion and said uh, to my wife, uh, I don't want you to hear this on the radio. There's been an attack in Beirut. We don't have any reason to think Arnie was uh, hurt, but we'll keep you informed. And uh, after that, it took eight hours. I'll tell you why in a minute. But uh, every time the phone rang, my mother, according to my wife, almost had a heart attack, but my wife was a good Navy wife. She said, don't be afraid of the phone rings. It's either going to be no news or good news. Be afraid of a knock on the door. And uh, so every now and then the chaplains would call and say, no news yet, no news yet. Okay. But four days after the explosion, a, a White House team visited, you know, led by uh, then Vice President uh, George H.W. Bush. And um, among the people that joined the White House team was the commandant of the Marine Corps, P.X. Kelly. I actually, after uh, that visit went with him, he invited me to go with him to the hospital in Italy where he put purple hearts uh, on the patients who had uh, wounded, who had been taken there. But also the commander of the Sixth Fleet, my boss, uh, Ed Martin. Now, he was a vice admiral with a very uh, important story. He had been in Vietnam almost six years as a prisoner of war, almost all of that time in uh, solitary confinement. So he was a man who was driven. He was a gentleman. He was a great leader. But it was he had lost six years of his life in his mind, and he didn't want to lose any more. So he didn't have a lot of time for un unnecessary courtesies, you might say. So he came up to me when that uh, group came, and he hugged me. I couldn't believe it. He was touching me. I was lieutenant commander. He's a vice admiral. And there were tears in his eyes, and he was apologizing to me. And he apologized. He said, I know your family waited so long. We were in touch you know, with the people in Beirut within seconds of the explosion. But I just didn't know how to ask if you were alive. You were the only person from my staff there as if I cared more about you than all of the others who were dying. So that's the reason. And it's interesting, one lesson I've learned as a chaplain is not just uh, you know, how to ask a question, but what questions to ask. Because evidently, after eight hours, one of the uh, captains on his staff, using the radio telephone, asked in Be to Beirut, they said, instead of asking whether uh, I was alive, they said, given the casualties, is chaplain, Chaplain Reznikov coming back on schedule, or is he staying to help with the wounded? And they said, he's helping, he's here. And that's when they could call my family and say that I was alive. So you have to know how to ask, uh, ask a question. Um, but the other interesting thing about the visit was the invitation I got to write a report. You know, Vice President uh, Bush asked me, when my head cleared, he wanted me to write a report by being there as a chaplain. Uh, 
again, there's always funny things, even from a tragic story. You know, he told me, um, you know, put the uh, report in an envelope and on top of it, put a little page that said, being sent to the president at the request of the vice president. So uh, when I finally got back to the Sixth Fleet and I talked to my admiral, I said, do I really send it straight to the White House or do I go through the chain of command? He said, are you kidding? You're so junior, it would take 100 years of you go through the chain of command between you and the president. If the vice president said, send it, send it. So I got back a nice letter from President Reagan that said, to thank you for your words. Thank you for your deeds. I hope you don't mind if I share your words with others. So again, I went to my admiral and I showed him the letter and he laughed and he said, that means he's going to show it to Nancy. So uh, we all had a big chuckle. And then we got the videotape, you know, that President Reagan had decided uh, when he spoke at the conference led by Jerry Falwell and 20,000 Southern Baptists, he was giving the keynote speech. He decided to read the entire report. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was amazing that that happened and, and very proud. But again, it's so important to tell this story. Absolutely. And I'm going to back up just a touch and say that before, and we'll, we'll get to Reagan's speech, I think in a little bit, uh, oh, in okay. a few okay. minutes, but I did want to back up just such, when you met with those folks in Beirut who were there from the White House, you made such an impression on them, actually, that uh, Edward Hickey sent a cable back to the White House, to Reagan's uh, chief of staff, James Baker. And this is what, for our listeners, what he wrote about his meeting with you. He said, quote, one memory I shall cherish a lifetime is a Navy Jewish chaplain working in the rubble, consoling and inspiring the rescue workers, wearing a round piece of camouflage cloth in place of a yarmulke. On Friday preceding the tragedy, the rabbi held a memorial service for a Marine. He asked the Protestant and Catholic chaplains to join hands and read the 23rd Psalms in unison. His purpose was to symbolize what we as Americans were trying to accomplish. He told the assembled battalions of Marines, many of whom would be in that building on Sunday, that if we were successful, someday Christians, Muslims, and Jews in that troubled part of the world would be able to join hands and when that day arrives, Lebanese children would be able to grow up in a society like ours, like in the society in which those young Marines grew up, one of security, peace, and freedom. The morning of the explosion, the Protestant chaplain was in the building and trapped under debris. The rabbi and priest sharing a room in a building about 50 meters away rushed to the scene. The Protestant chaplain was one of the first they came across. Ignoring the possibility of secondary explosions and with an easy aim of snipers due to fires which lit the area, they managed to extract the injured chaplain from the wreckage and carried him to safety. Now, that brings us back to Danny Wheeler, who was your good friend and who was the, the Lutheran chaplain there. And you were there when Danny was rescued. And the, the cable has it a little off. It wasn't one of the first rescues. In fact, Danny would be the last survivor pulled out who would live. And he'd spent about five hours uh, buried under that building. Talk to us about that dramatic moment of being there and helping with the rescue of of your faith brother. Yeah, you know, uh, Hooch and I were so sure that Danny was dead. Uh, it's a terrible thing to say, but we already started to discuss the fact that the two of us together would visit his widow uh, back in the States. You know, so uh, survivors had been pulled out. We thought there were no more survivors. And then actually the stole that Danny would use during services um, was kind of flapping around near the place that he was buried. And it was Pooch that recognized it and said, that's Danny's stole. We got to get them to dig here. And so again, Pooch is the hero. And and we found Danny, uh, you know, the people yelled down, you know, because they realized someone was there, but we still could not imagine that he was physically unharmed. You know, we didn't know how he would be when we pulled him up. You know, so many of the people that we were finding were, were terribly wounded, but he was physically, as a matter of fact, he, he joked later, he told told me that I was treating him like a newborn baby, counting the fingers and toes. and uh, But it was a miracle. It was just a miracle. Now, you know, I, I can't 
even begin to talk about the emotional pain, you know, but but physically he was whole and we hugged and, and you know, and then they uh, took him to a helicopter to get him to a hospital. And uh, but every person we rescued, it was a miraculous rescue. He, he was someone very close to me because of the chaplaincy, because of the time we, uh, but, but, you know, I don't want to diminish the sadness I had when we found others, the dead bodies or the people who survived, but it, it was a miracle. And Pooch and I um, literally thanked God. There was a, there's also, you were, you and Father Pucciarelli, some of the first two on that scene. Um, did you immediately go right to comfort people or to dig? Because I know you did help pull people out of that rubble as well. Was it a combination of of helping pull out and comforting? And uh, what, what was what was that like? Did you do just what was necessary in your head, or did you think I need my job is now to do this, or did that expand when you saw the scope of the devastation? Yeah, immediately. We both ran to wounded, to people on the ground. And well, other Marines could do digging. We knew that we could do comforting. I mean, everyone could, but we knew that that would be an immediate role for us. So we, for him, he would also give the uh, official uh, last rites. Uh, you know, if, if, but but the idea of hugging, of holding, of comforting, of telling them more, more help was on the way, just letting them know people knew they were there. Because, you know, when there's a, such a giant explosion and people are blown this way and that way, they, they're they disoriented. They didn't know, many of them didn't know what happened. Even Danny, when, when we uh, rescued him, he still thought that his corner, his office must have been hit by a shell. Uh, he asked, I remember one of the first things he asked was how his RP, his religious program specialist, the chaplain assistant was, uh, you know, uh, so many, I mentioned it in the report that I sent to Reagan, so many people, their first words were asking how others were, but they still thought, you know, that it was a shell or a mortar hitting a part of the building. None of them realized, I don't don't think that the whole building was essentially gone, reduced to rubble. So I, I, and I'm sure it was Pooch the same thing. We ran to, to the to the people who were wounded, the people who needed help, uh, and then you know when 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 medical assistance, when people were helping all those, um, then we spent time uh, with the people who were digging. Uh, you know, again, they needed comfort also. And um, it, it was just such a sad and tragic uh, time. And some, it was very hard to, to, to kind of redirect our emotions where we give thanks for the people who survived rather than just crying for the people who died. But that's also part of the process, you know, and slowly but surely. The other thing I'll say is I have to salute the Marines for many reasons. Uh, but not a single person, you know, there was like a wire fence around the airport. And you could see people on the other side. Uh, Marines had rifles, especially those you know who were uh, assigned uh, stations. Not a single person fired wildly, shot, you know, at others through the fences. Uh, and, and I think that uh, part of that, of course, is Marine training, Marine discipline. Uh, we were there, you know, to defend ourselves and others, but not not to go on the attack, especially if we didn't know who who was out there. But I think part of it, I like to think part of it came from those foxhole uh, talks that we had about the fact that uh, everybody in Beirut at that time had reason to hate other people because everybody had lost a, a child or a brother or a sister or a parent, and that the cycle of violence, of hatred, just went on and on and on. And at some point, the cycle had to be broken. And maybe I'm reading too much of it, but I like to think that the Marines that didn't go crazy firing, you know, but instead uh, took their positions of defense, helped people dig, helped people, had decided that they 
we're not going to be part of that cycle, that downward cycle of violence and hatred. Yeah. And uh, something came from you from the Old Testament as uh, as you're on the scene. Um, and it was th these words here. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us all? Uh, when did that come to you uh, during the, the the rescue and recovery efforts? Yeah, uh, I think it uh, it kept recurring, but especially when Danny had used the word, uh, when Pooch had used the words to me in this country, where people of all religions are gunning for those of other religions. I think that's when it really sprung forth, you know, because there's so many countries in the world where religion uh, seems to be part of the problem, not part of the solution. I remember reading an article after 9-11 uh, written by Maureen Dowd, uh, who said that someone had discovered on a building near the Pentagon the words, God help us pr protect us from those who believe in you. And I think that's such a frightening thing to say. But again, you know, I think so many people now think that religion is part of the problem, not part of the solution. And that's why I think that the dreams, the faith dreams uh, that talk about the fact that we can get through this, we can go to better times, uh, are so important. And that uh, I think when I when I quoted that from, from the, the uh, Hebrew scriptures, I uh, you know, I, I thought to myself, uh, the world still has not gotten to that point where we can believe that we act like there's one God and God has created us all, but we have to keep that dream alive. And is that still the, the passage from scripture that you go back to that you think about when you reflect on October 1983, all these years later? I think so. I think so. You know, there's so many any uh, passages that give me hope and, and, and comfort. But uh, for that moment, seeing all those people on the ground, uh, absolutely, that's the verse that uh, I, I, I dream of the time when that can come true. Yeah. Yeah. It's a powerful, powerful experience. Um, yeah. James, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, Arnie, you know, um, that night, when you finally get a chance to sort of take a break from it all, you wrote a quick letter to your wife and mother uh, that you shared with us that we were able to use in the book. And I was going to ask, I think our listeners would love to hear you read that letter for them. And I know you've got a copy of it there. So if you could, uh, it's just uh, two pages. But I thought um, this was for, for listeners. This is a contemporaneous document. It was written that day after everything that Arnie's just told us he went through. And I think people will find it a uh, a, a powerful piece of history to, to listen to. Okay. So my wife, uh, unfortunately now she's my ex-wife, but we're still very close, but her name is Barbara. And uh, I mentioned to you that my mother was there. So this is dated actually October 23. So it was that first night. Uh, and I had no idea when the letter would be uh, delivered, but I wrote it that first night. And it says, Dear Barbara and Mom, I am all right, but things here are beyond description. Since a little after six this morning, I have been helping to pull people out from under debris and get them to makeshift medical wards. There are bodies and pieces of bodies all over. By now, you probably have heard I will be here until Sunday, 30 October, and then go to Toulon. I, I, I should add that my flagship, to Puget Sound was scheduled to make a uh, trip to France, and my mother was going to uh, go on it because they, you know, there was a family group that was meeting the ship there. So my admiral actually told me when I get back uh, to the ship, even if it's still there, he ordered me to miss movement, not to get on the ship, but to uh, meet it at the port, you know, where the families would be. So anyway, so uh, stay here until. 30 October, and then go to Toulon. It was hard not to run to you all, but you must understand this is one time I'm needed. The Protestant chaplain here was buried under rubble, but is miraculously alive. But he has been taken to a hospital and will not return to Beirut. They want my help here, 
to deal with the survivors and then to take part in an interfaith memorial service on Friday. Mom, please go on to Toulon as planned. I'll see you there as soon as I can. Barb, when we get back to Toulon, from Toulon, I'll take leave. We can all have a vacation in Venice. I love you all and miss you terribly. Then underlined, I say, I'm all right. It's just a terrible, terrible tragedy. If I can call, I will, but it may not be possible until I get to Toulon or I'm en route to there. I love all three of you. Arnie. So and powerful. Then I guess there's another one, 25 yeah, uh, October. Yeah, it's such a powerful letter. And again, you know, written that day after everything you'd seen and witnessed and, uh, you know, finding time to do that. Because that night, you know, work would go on throughout that night, uh, you know, just because the lights went out, you know, sun went down, you know, huge electric lights were put up so that rescue efforts could go on, you know, throughout the night. And that would, of course, continue over the next several days. Uh, as, as, as workers sort of dug through that pile. And so finding a, a moment there like that to, to take it, fire off a letter to your family and then to share it with listeners today is uh, it's very, very powerful. Thank you, Arnie, for that. Thank you. There's something else that you, you wrote. Um, this was a tragedy of people where each was unique and each had a story, each had a past and each had been cheated of a future. You know, and, and the human stories, uh, I forget if I put this in the in the report or I didn't, but, you know, afterwards, when we were going through the rubble, uh, a lot of the rubble included um, personal belongings. And uh, it, it was a birthday card, uh, a wedding uh, invitation or a picture. Those were the things that grilled it home to us, again, that this was just not some giant number, 241, you know, dead, so many more wounded. But, but each one, as I said, had a story. Each one, uh, you know, there's a there's an expression in uh, Judaism that says, uh, you know, you save one life, you save a world. You lose one life, you lose a world. Because each person could have had children, they could have had children, they could have had children. So I uh, Again, you know, this is 241 worlds uh, that were lost uh, that day. Uh, I, I particularly remember uh, two things. One, there was a baby announcement uh, from the Red Cross. You know, Red Cross is the organization that we use for news from home many times. And the father of the baby, the one who was supposed to get that notification, was one of the victims. So we put that uh, notification on a desk and uh, somehow I think I wrote this we all just seemed to avoid that desk. And then there was another memory someone found in the belongings someone found money and it was someone's personal uh, cash and um, it, it, we treated it like it was dirty we didn't want to take money from someone who had died so I remember someone actually lit it on fire and uh, after that, you know, we spread the word that any money you found, uh, give it to the chaplains because we're going to establish some sort of uh, fund for the widows and the orphans. But at that first time, we weren't thinking. We just we just didn't want to profit. We didn't want to take that money. So, so many different stories, human stories, uh, linked to the idea that these were people, not just some nuts. Number. These were individuals, and we had to remember them as individuals. A lot of times in incidents like this, it uh, people forget about, they, they concentrate on that number of the dead, but uh, not the wounded uh, and not the people who will carry the, uh, the emotional um, scars forever with them and deal with that uh, emotional trauma uh, of the battlefield. Uh, or they don't think, people don't think of uh, the children growing up without fathers in this case and uh, how that affects them for an entire, for a lifetime. Um, so a lot of that kind of gets uh, gets lost 
when you're watching the news or reading a magazine article and you just see a, a number um there the uh this, this is has generational implications and consequences as well yeah you know arnie i you know you wrote you mentioned earlier that report you wrote for the president and it's such a powerful powerful document um jack and i used it in the book we quote from it um of course reagan very famously used it in a speech and uh you know there there there's a couple on and i know you've got a copy of it there that i uh handy as well on the second page of that there's the top three paragraphs i think are just so powerful uh and if, if you wouldn't mind I'd, I'd love to have you just sort of recount those for us uh, and it's starting with it where it begins with there was a sense of god's presence so i'm reading now from the report there was a sense of god's presence that day in the small miracles of life which we encountered in each body that despite all odds still had a breath within, but there was more of his presence, more to keep our faith alive in the heroism and in the humanity of the men who responded to the cries for help. We saw Marines risk their own lives again and again as they went into the smoke and the fire to try to pull someone out, or as they worked to uncover friends, all the while knowing that further collapse of huge pieces of concrete precariously perched like dominoes could easily crush the rescuers. There was humanity at its best that day and a reminder not to give up the hope and dream of what the world could be in the tears that could still be shed by these men, regardless of how cynical they had pretended to be before, regardless of how much they might have seen before so powerful it's such a powerful observation of that day and going forward um and uh and we can james go back for some other questions here too but going forward are you still are you still processing what happened that day all these years later uh what was um, your uh journey following leaving Beirut, the days, the weeks, the months, the years, and how has that evolved over time? Yeah, you know, um, there's a web, there's a website, Beirut Veterans, and people uh, share memories, and it's each memory will drive another memory within me. Um, not too long ago, someone sent me the photo of. Um, the memorial service I led for Seufert, just that moment uh, where the Protestant and Catholic chaplain and I held hands. And I remember making that decision to invite them to join me for the 23rd Psalm, since that's something that uh, all Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish uh, worshipers uh, read and believe in the Psalms. And uh, But I had never seen that photo. So I just got it recently, and of course that um, drove so many more memories. And if, for a long time, uh, Pooch and I were in closer uh, contact. I actually saw him um, on the 35th anniversary of the uh, bombing. The White House had a uh, ceremony, and we were there, and he gave the prayer for the ceremony in the White House. The 35th fourth anniversary, there was a ceremony at the Marine Barracks in D.C. where uh, Vice President Pence was the host, and he's from a Marine family. And you could tell that uh, when he told the story and when he honored the Marines, it was very, very personal with him. So Democrat, Republican, you know, none of that stuff matters when we're remembering heroes. And uh, But I do remember that he had this personal connection. So at that ceremony, Ceremony and at the White House ceremony, you know, I saw other people who had survived, although more and more as we have these ceremonies, it's more the families of the survivors who attend because so many of us are dying out. Um, but everyone is hungry to hear a story of the person that they love, to hear some interaction that we had. So, you know, I, I can go a while and not think of it because there's other things on my mind. But but 
you know, some memory will drive other memories. And, you know, I'll pause, uh, you know, a silent prayer for those who didn't make it and a prayer for the families. Well, how did it uh, change your, did it change the trajectory of your life at all? Had you thought about maybe leaving the Navy or doing something else? Uh, how did it, did it change the trajectory of your, of your life when you look back? You know, it's interesting. Uh, the aftermath of Vietnam, which I can talk about if you want me to a little later, actually had bigger changes on my life. But what happened with Beirut was, you know, the, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, they have Air Force, they have war colleges. Again, a lot of civilians are familiar with the academies that are the level of uh, universities, West Point, the Air Force Academy, uh, Naval Academy, but they don't don't always know that we also have graduate level uh, educational facilities, the war colleges, where you get a master's, but it's also um, en route to becoming an, a general or an Air Force. Not everyone who goes becomes a general or an admiral, but it's very rare to become a flag officer without, or a general officer without going through that. So chaplains hardly ever went. I think uh, maybe one chaplain had gone by the time of Beirut from the Navy, but the chief of chaplains decided to send me as a student to the Navy War College um, and, and to concentrate on ethical responses to terrorism. Those were back in the days when we were still flailing and trying to grapple with what, how should we respond? And so I had a, a year there and uh, it was actually through my whole career, I hardly was anywhere more than two or three years. I happened to be four years in Newport because I was one year at the War College and then taught for three years at the uh, Naval Chaplain School. So it was kind of a dual assignment I had. But because I was going to continue there at the Chaplain School, the War College president asked me to create a course on religion and war to teach at the War College. It was an elective course which meant it didn't give credits, uh, but it was available for the students. So I created a course called Religion, War, and Peace, Faith, and Force. And we looked at the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and asked what in each one of those religions drove a person toward war, and what in each of those religions drove a person toward peace. It was a fact fascinating course and a lot of the students at the war college are from far excuse me foreign militaries and they were especially interested because many of them had never studied a religion not their own so another thing that i was lucky enough to be part of at the war college the war college the navy war college has three trimesters and in between the first two we had a tradition of a conference military and the media my class recommended that uh, in between the second and third, we should have an annual conference on ethics and leadership. And the War College accepted that idea, established it. They had me uh, give the opening uh, talk for the first one. And then for about 10 years, they brought me back to give a talk, either the opening or the closing or panel discussion. And so I got very, very involved. Uh, and of course, the lessons of I had learned from Beirut and from my whole career, including Vietnam, became part of what I would tell. And uh, so a lot of the future leaders in the military got to hear the story of Beirut, you know, that I would tell. And also the lessons that uh, at least the ones that I came up with through uh, the war. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I mentioned the uh, fact that we found things in the belongings of the uh victims, the people who died. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but one thing that we found a couple times was an envelope or a few envelopes with a rubber band around uh, with a note to be mailed in case of death. And that really was like a, a blow to the gut, you know, because these people, so it reminded me there's actually, and I wrote a whole article about this, there's actually a Jewish tradition called ethical wills, where, you know, a physical will, you decide who's going to get this piece of china or who's going to get this furniture in judaism the ethical will what stories what lessons from your life 
do you want to pass on to the next generation? And so uh, that's what those letters reminded me of. I wondered what they were. And so I, I actually started an ethical will for my daughter. And I, and I, uh, it's probably the most, her most favorite thing I've ever written, the article about it and the lessons that I, I took from my life that I want to pass on to her. Well, I, before we wrap then a, a little, a, a two-parter now, um, the, uh, the experience in Vietnam coupled with the experience in Lebanon, um, uh, maybe what are some of those? And then what, what have those made it into that letter for your daughter that other people might benefit from, uh, if they hear them from you right now? You know, um, a lesson from Vietnam, I think we changed the vision of America with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. You know, Jan Scruggs, uh, you know, enlisted man, a soldier who got out and experienced what all of us were experiencing. No, wel no welcome home, no thank you for your service, forget parades, forget anything, you know, when we came back from Vietnam, dribs and drabs, you know, now one of the lessons we've learned is we usually try to move units. But back then, an individual would go and an individual would come back. And people would treat us as if either we were dumb, we couldn't get out of the draft, or we were criminals, you know, because of things that went on. And what happened was we realized that people, if they hated the war, then they hated the war fighters. And Jan Scruggs had this idea for this memorial that would make no statement about the war. As a matter of fact, a lot of people call it the Vietnam War Memorial, but it's not. It's very specifically named the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And it was built to be a place that no matter what you thought about the war, you could honor those who died and by extension, those who served. There was almost 58,000 names on the wall of those who died. And again, as I say, by respecting them, we respect. And and it worked. It, it really changed the vision because the next uh, operations we were involved with, uh, Desert uh, Storm, Desert Shield, uh, that's when people started tying yellow ribbons around oak trees from the old country song to remember people who were serving. And I heard people say, hey, I may not be in favor of our being over there in this country or that country, but by God, I'm going to honor those who are serving. And so, you know, I, I learned that lesson that we helped people separate the views of the war from the views of the war fighter. I think that was a very, very important lesson. The other, uh, when, I, when I talk about an ethical will, I tell people, and I used to teach this, you know, to the people I would work with as a chaplain, I would tell them, write an ethical or write a, uh, the military actually encourages people to write physical wills now. I would tell the people that I work with to write this final letter that hopefully doesn't have to be sent, but think about it. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or not. This is a, a tradition. And I would say for those of you who believe in the Bible, include a special Bible verse. For those who don't, includes a teaching from your favorite professor or somebody who touched your life. And the one that I included in my letter to my daughter, and I describe in my article, it actually comes from the Book of Esther. The Book of Esther, uh, the Jewish holiday of Purim, is based on that. And it's a queen who's hiding her identity that she's Jewish from the king. But then the, the prime minister is, is planning a war to wipe out the Jews. So she needs to make a decision. Does she tell the king she's Jewish? Does she go to the king at all because of the you go without being invited, you could be killed. So she goes to her cousin who raised her and says, what should I do? And he says, I'm a man of faith. I believe God will help no matter what you do. But, and this is the verse, he says, who knows, but for this, you were brought to the kingdom. And so I teach my daughter, I teach my congregations, I teach my friends, when you have to make a hard decision, when you have to make a decision that might endanger your life, might endanger, you know, not not many decisions might endanger our life, but maybe it will endanger a promotion, maybe a, your popularity. Ask yourselves, who, who knows but for this moment I was brought to the kingdom? Who knows but for this opportunity I was given life? And that's a verse that I think of a lot. 
Wow. Well, I can't think of a, a better way to, to wrap this up. And I want to thank you so much for everything you did in, in Vietnam, in Lebanon, uh, for sharing your story with us, for everything you did all for all those years of, of service um, and for sharing this story now. It's, uh, it's so incredible. It's so powerful. Uh, and I'm sincerely humbled to be uh, talking to you right now. My honor, and I thank you so much for including me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast. Be sure and pre-order your copy of Targeted Beirut, the 1983 Marine Barracks bombing and the untold origin story of the war on terror. You can pre-order wherever books are sold. You can find me at Jack Carr USA on the social channels. Officialjackcar.com is the website. Click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you got something out of this conversation, be sure to like, subscribe, turn on notifications, and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting.